Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Jeff today, Jeff Good. Uh, in a short but illustrious career, he's done a very cool stuff with Chipmunks, with Jack Sullivan for his Masters. Then went on to Michael Narkman's lab in Arizona for his PhD. Postdoc was Fanti Pabo, where he contributed to this extraordinary wealth of information now on ancient hominids. Um, now as an assistant professor at the University of Montana. And Jeff's been a key collaborator with us for sort of getting the genomics end of the Grinnelby Survey Project going, so we're having lots of discussions about that while we're here. Uh, but today he's going to tell us about a different topic. Uh, this one. Go, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation and, and for coming here to special timing. It tickles me that there's actually my talk got shifted for a protest. <laughs> this fulfills every you know great stereotype that I have in my mind about how things are here and how they should be. That's great. So I, I I will try not to go over time. I would you know would hate to get in the way of the protest. So I'm excited about that. So. My research covers a lot of really diverse topics, and it's really motivated to understand the evolution of biological diversity. And there's lots of ways, and this is what evolutionary biologists do, there's lots of ways that you can address this problem. Um, so I tend to focus on the mammalian radiation, it's my favorite radiation, but in any particular biological radiation, you, I, I think to understand something like the impressive array of phenotypic diversity that we have here, you really have to understand a couple of different processes. One is the evolution of, of novel phenotypes and adaptive evolution within populations and within species. And the other is the actual splitting of lineages, so the, the process of speciation, things that result in new species. With my research program, we're, we're really focused on these two questions. And so we have a lot of work that's on speciation genetics, we do natural hybridization in chipmunks and a lot of experimental speciation genetics crosses and so forth to really understand what is the genetic basis of reproductive isolation and what, what are the, the underpinnings of the inability of two populations that are diverged to fuse back together. We also do a lot of work on genetic basis of adaptation and I won't really be able to talk about this at all today, um, including the evolution of seasonal change and the evolution of male reproduction. So we're really focused on these two, I think, um, integral and related topics. I don't think I need this. This <laughs> be too tempting. Um, but today I'm going to talk about the evolution of reproductive isolation. In particular, work that we've been doing really focused on the phenotypes that, um, that result when two species diverge and, and you get genetic divergence between them and you get reproductive isolation. And so, like many things in evolutionary biology, we think about this transition from genotype to phenotype. In the context of speciation, you can think of all the, re the is reproductively isolating phenotypes that might matter. So everything from mate choice and behavioral isolation to things like inviability and sterility. So there's a lot of important questions in this. The relative importance of different barriers to reproduction. So are they prezygotic things that prevent fertilization versus postzygotic unfit hybrids? Um, I think the relative importance of these two topics is something that hasn't been adequately adequately addressed in the literature, and, and I'm not going to change that today. I'm not going to focus on it at all. I'm going to focus mostly on the post-zygotic isolation, but this is really important, um, getting, getting a sense of how pre-zygotic processes play. We know things like, you know, any field biologist knows things like mate choice and behavioral isolation is key to speciation. Within trying to understand the, the genetic underpinnings of reproductive isolation, we, we tend to want to ask certain kinds of questions about the genetic basis. So, are there general genetic patterns that emerge? So speciation is a process that um, is the driver of biological diversity, but are there certain ways that, that new species form, and, and what are the underpinnings of that, and what evolutionary or population genetic processes contribute to that? And then ideally we'd like to know something about specific genes and or mutations that underlie reproductive isolation and, and bring the conversation from genotype to phenotype into really the, the dynamics of molecular biology. And then general evolutionary questions like how does evolutionary reproductive isolation occur? Is it due to positive selection drift? These kinds of classic questions. And we actually know quite a bit about the genetics of a certain kind of isolation that is postzygotic, intrinsic incompatibilities. And there's a lot of general um, patterns that emerge. So we know that often evolves due to divergent interactions between genes, that is 
genes within populations diverge through various processes, and then when you form a hybrid between two populations where this divergence has occurred, that hybrid genotype does not work well because of incompatible interactions between those divergent genomes. We know things like hybrid incompatibilities manifest in the heterogametic sex first. This is Haldane, the celebrated Haldane's rule. So heterogametic sex, the sex with two types of sex chromosomes. So in mammals and flies, this, these are males, XY. So in an addition to this, we know the X chromosome often plays a central role in speciation. And that's probably in part related to Haldane's rule. So the X chromosome is directly related to the heterogametic sex. But in addition to that, we know that X-linked hybrid male sterility in particular evolves very quickly. So if we look at the different kinds of phenotypes that isolate species, they tend to involve the X, hybrid male sterility in, in species where the male, males of the heterogametic sex tends to evolve very quickly. And this together suggests that the X chromosome and male sterility are uh, intricately and tied to the process of species divergence and, and speciation. So in addition to this, this has been an exciting time in the, in the last 10 years or so. There have been all these genes that have been identified that um, underlie hybrid incompatibilities. And so this is just a, you know, I'm going to go through all of this, but this is a recent table showing individual genes that have been identified that underlie some aspect of reproductive isolation. So this is exciting. This is kind of where people wanted to go for a long time. And there's been a lot of focus on asking if there are emergent trends that come from once you know the gene, what kind of insight do you actually gain? And so there are things here like the first pair of truly interacting incompatibilities. So the dubjansky muller model predicts this. We actually have specific genes that interact and interact poorly in hybrids between just two species of Drosophila and cause inviability. Other trends that are of interest here, um, things that tend to be involved in DNA binding and chromosome regulation are popping up differentially on this list. Um, and some of these descriptions of DNA binding. Some of these are more well-founded than others, but this seems to be a general trend that's interesting. And then there's evolutionary patterns, so inferred evolutionary processes that contribute to these, the divergence of the genes. Um, a lot of emphasis has been placed on genetic conflict of various sorts, and then evidence for positive selection indicated here with the red stars. So what I want to argue or present to you today is that this is incredible progress and that we've learned some aspects about reproductive isolation from these kinds of studies, and, and I really hold them up as some of the most important individual studies on informing how the evolution of reproductive isolation evolves. But I would argue that when we're, most people doing speciation genetics have actually tended to really not place a lot of emphasis on the phenotype. And, and with some of these systems, there's a lot of power to get right to the genotype, so individual genes are involved in reproductive isolation. But how that actually maps onto the phenotypic space is less clear. And I think that this limits the kinds of insights we can make. So this is treated as a back black box. Often you see a black box between genotype and phenotype. But I would say even the phenotype is treated as, as not a very important part of the study, or at least not thought about in, in, in a careful way. And, and hopefully this will make sense as to what I mean about that throughout the talk and why this is important. For example, in Drosophila, where some of the best work has been done, this is the kinds of reproductively isolated phenotypes. You put a bunch of flies in a vial, do mass matings, and ask, are there any offspring? If yes, then fertile. If no, then sterile. Kind of very rough, coarse phenotype. Or if you, if you do a uh, squash on a testis, are there sperm, and do they wiggle? And if they wiggle, everything's good. And I, I don't mean that in any kind of deprecating way. Those really are the assays that underlie these genes, the, these studies that find individual genes, and they've been very powerful, but we have no idea what is actually wrong that leads, leads to the reduction of offspring or the, the lack of motility. So what we've been trying to do is to ask if there are general developmental processes. So gene function aside, general developmental processes that are key in the evolution of reproductive isolation. So particular pathways and our steps in either spermatogenesis, if we're talking about fertility, or just individual development where things tend to go wrong and you tend to um, result in the evolution of reproductive isolation. And these are the kinds of generalities we want to, to know and we want to know what general processes drive the evolution of the species.
So I'm going to tell you about two projects we've been doing. One is in a much more developed state than the other, but they, they both tie into this um, focus on the phenotype. So I've been working for a long time now on the developmental basis of hybrid male sterility. And so we'll talk about work I've been doing in house mice, mostly crosses. It does relate to natural populations with hybridized, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But um, we're going to, I'm going to tell you about the X chromosome and spermatogenesis, work we've done mapping the genetic basis of sterility in the system, and then in newer work where we've really become focused on particular developmental processes that we think underlie the evolution of reproductive isolation in mice and may be a general mechanism for the evolution of hybrid male sterility in, in animals in general or mammals specifically. Then I'm going to turn and tell you about work, new work that I'm pretty excited about that we're doing on abnormal hybrid development and talk about particular pathways that seem to influence um, development of hybrids and how that and the genetic mechanisms that lead to disruption of that and there may be generalities in this as well. And so this is new work that we're doing in hamsters. Um, so first, the X in male sterility. So why the X and why sterility? So this, this is a really common pattern people have shown repeatedly. The X chromosome contributes to hybrid male sterility. And there's lots of evolutionary hypotheses that have been put forth, the general hypotheses that have been put forth to explain this. Um, and some of these are just general predictions for population genetic theory. You may get faster evolution on the X chromosome for genes that influence male function because they're immediately exposed and because in the heterogametic sex you have no masking of, of recessive mutations. So there's theoretical predictions. Support for this empirically is mixed. Um, there's ideas like meiotic drive or gene movement may be special in the X chromosomes of things that influence segregation of sex chromosomes or duplication on and off. All of these may contribute to reproductive isolation. These are inherently evolutionary hypotheses that are pre pretty largely divorced from the biology of spermatogenesis, for example. <coughs> this fourth one, the idea that there may sen be inherent sensitivity to giving a genesis and it has to do with regulatory disruption of the X chromosome, is actually totally based on, it is not an evolutionary hypothesis in general, it's, it's totally based on the biology of spermatogenesis. And I'm going to focus on this today. Now, all of these are not mutually exclusive, and the story likely involves probably some combination of all of these. But I'm going to argue that there may be an important step here that is inherent in the biology of, of spermatogenesis. So, a quick crash course on spermatogenesis, you basically have transition from, from diploid cells, um, to haploid germ cells through two rounds. So you have duplication and two rounds of um, reduction for meiosis where you end up with these haploid um, spermatids. Okay? And so this is the, one of the most complicated developmental processes in the body. There's a lot going on here. And we know that there are particularly interesting aspects of this with respect to the X chromosome. So in particular, midway through this process, the X and Y chromosome are inactivated. So during meiosis, the X and Y chromosome basically balled up into heterochromatin and shoved to the side of the cell. Okay? So the key step is well, well described in lots of, um, in particular in mammals, but in other organisms as well. And this is called meiotic sex chromosome inactivation. And then after meiosis, um, you, you then get the continued repression of expression on the X chromosome postmeiotically. So why might this matter for speciation? Well, we know in general that if this process is disrupted, for example, in humans or in mice in, in, in natural populations, you get sterility. So it's a very sensitive process that when disrupted, you get sterility. And so people have put forth that maybe this is a very inherent sensitivity that why you would get the evolution of rapid hybrid male sterility on the X chromosome is because this process with evolutionary divergence between species and populations is often disrupted. But there's actually very little <coughs> empirical evidence for this, this being demonstrated. And we'll come back to that in a second. So, now some background on the system that we're studying. House mice, um, clearly one of the most majest majestic ecological animals you could ever see. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Very fascinating for studying aspects of speciation. Um, so these are Western, Eastern European Species or subspecies, depending on who you talk to, um, that argument is not as interesting as the fact that they're very closely related. Recent divergence, they come into secondary contact along this very well-studied hybrid zone in nature. One of the primary phenotypes isolating them in nature seems to be hybrid male sterility. There's no obvious ecological correlates. So this is 
We're studying a system where intrinsic post isolation really matters, and it matters in nature, and patterns that we see in the lab we can go back and check in, in um, a natural setting. We know there's a large effect of the X chromosome. We see this on the hybrid, in the hybrid zone, the X chromosome, there's no introgression across the hybrid zone, there's very low gene flow. Things that contribute to reproductive isolation likely live on the X chromosome in house mice. So we've done a bunch of experiments to really jump into this. Now house mice have been studied for 30 or 40 years on the genetics of, of hybrid male sterility and so forth, but people haven't, hadn't really done a really systematic survey of patterns that you get from animal, animals isolated from nature and in a, in a series of crosses to see what is the basic architecture of reproductive isolation and how does the X chromosome play in. So we've done a series of crosses um, between domesticus and musculus, so for the rest of the talk, musculus will be in black, domesticus in white. Here I've just shown a couple of the autosomes and then the sex chromosomes. And the point is, we do reciprocal crosses. And the point about a reciprocal cross is that when you change who mom and dad is, the autosomal genotype is identical, but the, the origin of the sex chromosomes is different. If you see different outcomes in reciprocal crosses, it points to um, a possible role of the sex chromosomes. So we, We've done a bunch of pairwise reciprocal crosses within and between four wild-derived inbred strains. And that's the data I'm going to show you um, next, and we'll, we'll step through some of the interesting patterns we see. So here are two correlates that we think are very important for a reproduction in house mice. Um, relative testis weight, standardized for body weight, and sperm count. Now, I did just kind of argue that you needed really detailed phenotypes for reproductive isolation, and it's really important to jump into this, and here these are not very detailed phenotypes. So for everything I'm going to tell you about, we've done a ton of different things, sperm head, morphology, motility, fertilization efficiency, in vivo, in vitro, histology, lots of things. I'm going to talk about some of the simple patterns, but as necessary, I'll talk about some of the more complicated phenotypes. But for these two ones, these seem to um, really matter. These are the two within each species, intraspecific crosses, normal testis weight, normal sperm counts in the millions. The things to see here are a couple. So first, fertility is lower in many of the hybrid males. So the darker distributions here are falling outside the range of the parentals. The second thing is in, there is asymmetry in some reciprocal process. So we, we always get sterility when musculus is the mom and domesticus is the dad. But in, so when we do the reciprocal, sometimes we, we get fertile animals. Okay? This difference between these two relates to a genotypic difference between the two strains, the two wild dried inbred strains that we used within musculus. This suggests that there's polymorphism for hybrid incompatibility genes still segregating within musculus, which is really interesting. Um, there's been some report of uh, polymorphic sterility within musculus and domesticus before. Um, including a really nice study by Yuri Farid on um, an individual, a specific gene that contributes to hybrid male sterility in house mice, um, PRDM9. This is, this is a whole aspect of a research seminar that I'm not going to go into today. I can just tell you that we're actively mapping the genetic basis of this polymorphism. It's not PRDM9, and it's clearly a, one or a couple of autosomal factors that are still segregating within here. So, this is important because we're, we're really at the earliest stages of speciation. So we're accumulation of hybrid incompatibilities before you actually get the fixation of these within natural populations. What I'm going to focus on from here on out is the asymmetry and what this may tell us about the sex chromosome um, evolution. Here we're basically seeing sterility when we have a muscular sex chromosome and a domestic is Y and then in some reciprocal crosses things are fine. So to jump into this in more detail, what we did was we took, we did a series of experiments where we constructed what are called reciprocal subconsomic strains. So that's just a fancy way of saying we took the X chromosome, broke it up into pieces, and reciprocally moved it between the two species. This experiment tells you if there's um, reproductive isolation related to the X chromosome when you move it from one genomic background to the other. So in this experiment, we moved musculus X chromosome into domesticus and we pretty much did it in thirds. We ask if we see sterility here, it's due to this introgression of the X and presumably interacting with something on this background. Experiment two, we do the reciprocal. Okay? So this, is, this was a ton of work, intercrosses, followed by several genera nine generations of back crosses where we selectively screen offspring and get the genotypes we want, and we do a bunch of phenotyping. 
It's about three years of work. <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> so, um, massive sterility here, and um, even though these, the amount of work is equal on these two sides, the result is slightly more exciting here. Very interesting. We see nothing when we move the x this direction. But here we see a lot of sterility. So I'm going to focus on this sterility in the next several slides and, and kind of what we see here. But um, is an inherent asymmetry in the X chromosome sterility that we see in these reciprocal introgressions. And moving that domesticus X chromosome into musculus does nothing that we've been able to detect. So we've looked at a lot of phenotypes here. And these, here's one that's particularly compelling. We can look at sperm head morphology. So these are um, individual sperm heads. So mice and, and most rodents have a very hooked sperm head. And when you get disruption of development of the sperm head, you get a more flattened head. Shape. And so these are examples of different genotypes in our experiment, going from a shortened, hip, um, shortened hook, flattened head, to this really um, severely abnormal morphology. When we looked at this, we, we saw a lot of interesting patterns. And so this is just showing you, this is the X chromosome, progressively moving more and more X chromosome from musculus into the domesticus. So the entire, for this, for this genotype, the entire autosomal background would be essentially white. Okay, these are late generation introgressions. We're just testing what do, moving these chunks in is actually doing to the phenotype. And this is just one way to plot it, but you can see as you get progressively more X chromosome from the other species, you get worse and worse sperm head morphology. So going from essentially most being normal to when you get about half of the X or a third of the X, you're getting a large expansion of these slightly defective and then down here, when you get most of the X, you basically are getting no normal sperm, and you even get some of these um, these shapes that defy my ability to outline them. <laughs> <laughs> so this quite very severely disrupted. So this is not what we expected to see. It's really complicated. Now, when you move the X chromosome in the other direction, you see nothing. But here, this indicates a very complex genetic basis. There are several things that are contributing to isolation or to this abnormal phenotype in this direction. And so we've, we, the idea was to ind independently map individual regions of the X that cause sterility. And in that sense, this experiment was a colossal failure. <laughs> because actually, independent regions, we were able to identify four regions, the whole X chromosome, broken up into four regions that cause these phenotypes individually. As we broke these up into smaller chunks, we lose the phenotype. So it's not that there are just four genes that underlie this. There's essentially, the more X you get, the worse you're off. Some, some are worse than others. We just the QTL map of this. Um, I wouldn't read a lot into the individual peaks. When you have this much tight linkage, you can't really dis distinguish individual effects. But this is just a map showing the likelihood that there's a quantitative trait low side that influences abnormal sperm head morphology in this region versus this region and so forth, this is the significance threshold. So the whole X is linked to sterility. Some areas, in particular this region right in the center, which also shows very low gene flow in nature across the hybrid zone, seems to be particularly key, but not anything that we can independently map. So this led us to think, we went into this thinking about individual genes that may be contributing to isolation. This observation led us to think about maybe there are larger order processes that are related to the X and they're contributing to this. And in particular, we know the X is specifically regulated across spermatogenesis. Is there an aspect of gene regulation for the X chromosome that could lead to this kind of pattern? Why is it that the whole X is basically blowing up in reproductive isolation? So we then turn to a bunch of experiments where we were looking at gene expression across spermatogenesis to, to uh, tackle this question. So. Going back to F1 genotypes, we looked, so these are some of the same genotypes that you would have, were in that original um, comparison of testis weight. Where we have within species crosses that produce normal fertile males, and then between species reciprocal crosses, one of which is fertile and one is sterile. So we collected testis from these, we controlled for age, we did three replicates per genotype, so 12 total arrays here. When we looked at expression, we wanted to ask if there are regulatory differences specific to the sterile animals that um, that are informing us about isolation. So there's two important contrasts here. There's an evolutionary contrast between the species, and then there's a contrast between 
fertile genotypes and sterile genotypes. Okay? So first, the evolutionary contrast between the species. There's about 7,000 genes using some conservative criterion that were expressed <laughs> in this experiment. And of those, about 1,400 or so were significantly different. And this is their plot by chromosome. So we have an expected number of genes on a given chromosome um, based on what were detected in the experiment and then those that were significantly different. And the thing here that was interesting is that the X actually stands out, but in the opposite direction. When you look at evolutionary differences between the species, it's exceptionally conserved. Many fewer significant differences on the X chromosome than you would expect, given the number of genes on that. So there's no faster male or faster X evolution here. In fact, the X is really re uh, regulatorily conserved um, for spermatogenic genes. So not a lot of divergence between the species. When we look at those subset of genes that are significantly differentially expressed in sterile animals relative to the two fertile ge um, parental genotypes or the reciprocal <laughs> hybrid that's fertile, we see exactly the opposite pattern. So you can see the X appears to be a slight outlier here. <laughs> it's way out of where you expect. You get about three times more significantly differentially expressed genes in sterile males. And interestingly, they're all they're overrepresented on the X, and they're all overexpressed. So these are significant differences. Well, 94% of them are genes that are more highly expressed in sterile males. So this this is an interesting pattern, and we're thinking immediately begin to think that this regulatory process, where the X chromosome is shut down during spermatogenesis, maybe it's just not going on in the sterile males. Maybe they're just expressing everything. There's a really important nuance to this kind of analysis is actually important to any kind of evolutionary contrast between two species when you look at testis or you look at any tissue and you compare expression levels and that, that is it can primarily be driven by the phenotype that you see so when we look at this is a cross-section of testis histology when we look at this a sterile male is def defined by not producing very much sperm that means they don't have very much of the cells latent spermatogenesis that become sperm cells they're histologically fundamentally different than a fertile animal. So here we have these di very dramatically diminished numbers of postmodic cells and lots of other problems in this cross section, but very few postmodic cells. Okay. So when you compare these genotypes, fertile, fertile, fertile versus sterile, we know that the, the histology tells us that th these sterile animals any independent gene regulation changes aside, we expect there to be these um, biases that exist in the data that relate only to the histology. Sterile animals have very few postmodic cells. We actually expect when we compare those to fertile animals that postmodic genes will be downregulated. Mitotic genes will show higher expression. This is an artifact of the histology, it has nothing to do with the evolution of gene regulation. This is likely to be true of any contrast between two species where there's any evolutionary difference in histology in a given tissue. This is not just sterility or just the testis. This is true of evolutionary <coughs> contrast for expression. So what we did to address that is we used, uh, there's a lot known about what genes are involved in spermatogenesis in mice, and so we used a computational approach where we identified individual genes that were known to be primarily expressed in somatic, mitotic, meiotic, or postmodic cells, so subsets of the testis. And then we, we, we um, used this, and then we looked for those patterns that were robust to this bias. Okay? So first, looking at the autosomes, we expect the sterile an um, animals to show significant differences that are upregulation of mitotic and postmotic that are downregulated. And this is exactly what we see on the autosomes. So sterility correlated genes, everything is just an artifact of the cellular composition. Like you see postmotic genes higher in sterile males, Universally, we see um, these lower in sterile males for postmotic genes and this apparent upregulation of, of um, mitotic genes in sterile males. This is just because they have more mitotic cells relative to postmotic cells. So nothing to do with speciation as far as I can tell. It just totally confounds it. But we can look at things that are postmotic that are higher in, in sterile males or mitotic that are um, lower in sterile males, which is opposite of this expectation. So maybe you can probably see where I'm going with this. This is on the autosomes. This is what the X looks like. We have 45 sterility correlated genes that are robust to these kinds of biases. When we map these out, what we see is that overwhelmingly, yes, the X is upregulated, but overwhelmingly, it's all these postmodic genes. So, you know, this the X is about 5% of the genome. Massive overexpression of postmodic genes on the X. Okay. 
So this is actually allowing us to tease apart all of the confounding factors of the histology and get at the actual underlying processes, at least for the X, there seems to be this very precise signal of a loss of repression of the X chromosome in the sterile animals at this particular time point in spermatogenesis. So this is our large X effect here. If we hadn't thought very carefully about the spermatogenesis and the underlying phenotype, we would have not been able to get to this particular prediction and clear up all of the confounding data that was kind of driving the overall significant differences in expression. So then the question is, and this is kind of active work that we're still working on very much, is this disruption of myotic sex chromosome inactivation or, or is it post-myotic sex chromosome repression? So these are very complicated processes. Ideally, we would like to know what, exactly where in development things are falling apart. And this is difficult to do, and our experiment was imperfect um, using the computational approach, but now what we've been working on for about the last eight months or so is to actually try and isolate these individual cells. So this is these individual cells, and you see that the X and the Y are inactivated right, partway through meiosis, and then they remain repressed later on, and then everything is inactivated late in spermatogenesis. So what we've been doing actually is we've been optimizing techniques to take the test as digested, isolate individual cell types, and then we're going to look at expression of individual enriched cell populations outside the context of the overall test, but get enriched populations that then aren't confounded by this histological difference. So we had to do single suspension um, digestions of the testis, and I'm happy to say that this is finally working. This was harder than I thought it would be. But we got it worked out. So this is just a, we use this technique called, it's a flow cytometry technique, fluorescence activated cell sorting. And because the difference the different cell types of spermatogenesis have different sizes and DNA contents. We can stain them with dyes that, that, that stain to DNA and actually um, identify those different cell populations using these, these fluorescence approaches. And so this is an example in these scatter plots. And you actually can, we can parse out these individual cell types and isolate these into tubes and extract RNA directly from them and control for everything. So what we're doing right now, we finally got this to work. It, these plots did not look like this when we first started. They were a little mess. We got this working now, and we're actually testing whether or not the disruption of X, the X chromosome expression, where it's occurring. Is it occurring right here, right on this side of the boundary, or is it much later in spermatogenesis, or even in these round spermatids? So we're developmentally localizing this signature right now. That's what we're working on. And so. If you invite me back for a seminar at some point in the future, I'll tell you the answer. We're getting really close. We're not quite there yet, but we got it worked out now where we can study these cell populations in isolation. So it's pretty exciting. So the recap what I've told you about hybrid male sterility in mice. We looked at F1 male sterility, showed you that it was um, polymorphic and asymmetric. F1 hybrid males um, were caused, these sterility phenotypes were caused primarily by postmyotic problems. We then did a bunch of mapping, and we showed overwhelmingly that it's linked exclusively to the, almost exclusively to the X chromosome in musculus, and that it had a very complex genetic, and I didn't talk so much about the phenotypic <coughs> basis, but it's very complex on the X. Not amenable to individual mapping. This led us to changing our strategy to actually look at overall regulatory patterns. We see widespread overexpression of the musculus X chromosome in sterile F1 males, this implicates this disruption of this key developmental process. So this is one of the first examples where this process, myotic sex chromosome exam, um, inactivation or postmyotic sex chromosome repression, has been local, linked directly to hybrid male sterility. So what? I mean, it's a single case study, right? Does it matter? Well, I think it is going to matter. If you're the first case study, you can, you can say that. <laughs> but does hybrid male sterility often have a common developmental basis? It turns out that the realization that this myotic sex chromosome inactivation may actually be very general as a basic evolutionary process that evolves within in different animals independently. And so it's been described in mammals, grasshoppers, worms, flies, although this has been recently debated again, and chickens. And so it actually has a pretty, pretty wide distribution where the sex chromosomes are inactivated during spermatogenesis. And so this is a, a shared developmental mechanism that could contribute to generally to the evolutionary effect of isolation. Of course, to test this, we'll have to test in additional species pairs. And there are people doing this work in flies, and well, at least in flies. 
to ask if this is linked um, to this developmental process. But <laughs> focusing on the developmental process and the phenotype is the only way you can actually address this kind of general um, phenotypic pattern in the evolution of reproductive isolation. So we'll see what the future holds and if this actually is general or just something specific to mice. Okay, with my second, the second part of the talk here, I'd like to shift into the work that we've been doing on hybrid development in mammals. And this is a really, hybrid male sterility has been studied a lot. But this is actually a topic that's been, had a much less focus on it. Um, and we also think it may be a general developmental mechanism that's worth looking at. So we're going to talk about development, growth, and hybrids, and some patterns of disrupted growth that we see in these hybrid hamsters that we've started working on, and um, work towards a you know, genetic and developmental basis here. So abnormal development in mammals. It turns out that there's a lot of evidence, although some of it's partial and indirect, that development is often messed up in hybrids in mammals. And there's a classic example where you get abnormal growth in mammals um, depending on, on the direction of the cross and how you combine two, two species. And so this is um, everybody's favorite hybrid in mammals, I think. <laughs> Lion-tiger crosses, every, you know, it's a staple of zoos for years. And you have tigons, which is, um, and ligers. And so cro a liger is a cross between a male lion and a female tiger and the reciprocal cross is a tigon. So lions are slightly smaller than tigers. You do these reciprocal crosses, and you see something pretty cool, and that is that the ligers are massive. So they're about 150% the size of a tiger up to. They're big. That's why they're, I guess they're, really <laughs> so they're huge, right? And, and, and this is a really interesting pattern. The tigons are actually about as big as a lion, maybe slightly smaller. So just depending on who mom and dad is, you get this, this really asymmetric effect of size. And it turns out that anecdotally, there's a lot of work in mammals that are related to zoos or just descriptions of hybrids were massive, but they often weren't, or hybrids were really small, but often they weren't doing both reciprocal crosses. There's anecdotal evidence that this may be a very general pattern that happens when you cross mammals. The, disrupt, the development is disrupted. A better studied example is crosses between Paramiscus polynotus and Paramiscus manipulatus. So these two species of deer mice um, show this interesting par parent of origin effect. Um, that the same kind of pattern as lions and tigers, although people haven't done the careful, sorry if you can't see that at the back. When you do a cross between polynotus and manipulatus, and polynotus is the mom, the hybrids are massive. This is the placenta, it's really huge. Placental weight is linked to um, embryonic weight and also can be linked to um, later stages of development. So really large placenta, large embryos. Reciprocal cross, so this is a normal individual. Reciprocal cross, this is a normal individual and then this is about 40% smaller when you just switch who mom and dad is. So this is well described in the, in the literature and, and in the late 90s, Paul Verana actually came up with the mechanism for this. And so he argued that genomic imprinting is disrupted in these interspecific hybrids. And this is a pretty cool mechanism. So what is genomic imprinting? So most genes are expressed in a Mendelian fashion. You get expression of mom and dad's alleles. Um, for imprinted genes, you get silencing of one of the two copies. Okay? And it shows this really predicted, uh, consistent pattern in, in development is that in embryonic pathways, so imprinted genes tend to occur in the placenta. Maternally expressed genes promote growth. Maternally expressed genes inhibit growth. We think it's a classic outcome of evolutionary conflict between the sexes. So males um, wanting to promote the growth of their offspring are expressing their alleles. Females are mediating that by um, downregulating it and vice versa. And so what Verona showed is that when you get differential loss of imprinting, you can get these parent of origin effects. If one of the two species is not passing on imprinted alleles in the hybrids, you'll get overexpressed um, growth factors or growth repressors, depending on where the allele came from. So loss of maternal imprinting in the placenta equals large hybrids. Loss of paternal imprinting in the placenta equals small hybrids. So this turns us to dwarf hamsters. Um, so we've been working on this system. We actually started studying them, this, them for the evolution of seasonal change. 
So they, they show this really cool phenotype where they turn white in the winter. And this is why we have them in the, in the lab, and we're actually studying this actively as, as a line of research. But we, we found some cool stuff when we got them in the lab, and, and this is kind of what, what I'm going to talk about now. These two species occur in Central Asia. They're models for seasonal change and paternal care. Um, they're very recently divergent. They were called subspecies until the mid-90s. They're allopatric in nature, although they may overlap. It's just not a very well-studied contact zone. Um, they show hybrid male sterility, and the, there's one report in the literature of some Russians did some crosses, and they said that there was massive heterosis when you crossed them, and, and when you did one particular cross, the, the embryos were really big. So we set forth to ask if reciprocal crosses show parent of origin growth effects, and if genomic imprinting is disrupted in hybrids. What, what time is it? It's about 10 to... Okay, so we're still, still good on time. I don't want, okay, not going into the protest. <laughs> okay, so get up more, <laughs> Protest me. So reciprocal crosses show that, do they show this parent of origin effect? It, it, it suggested there's overgrowth in one direction. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Is the genomic imprinting disrupted in the hybrids? So this is work that my graduate student, Tom Brecky, has been doing. And he's done a bunch of these reciprocal crosses. And what we see is actually, in one direction of the cross, we see massive placental overgrowth, exactly as predicted, um, given this parent of origin effect. So these are the two species, the two reciprocal crosses. We always put mom first. So when mom is a Campbelli, things are more or less similar. But when, you, when mom is Sungoris, you get massive overexpression. Or overexpression, you get massive uh, increase in size. So these are so big that we haven't, that they'll actually kill mom. So they get, they get so big, she can't birth them, at least not successfully yet. Um, and they actually, you know, it's, it's, it's pr pretty strong reproductive isolation. Overgrowth of the embryos is also very large. It's more variable, and, we, and it's not as clean of a phenotype, so I'm not showing it here. But they'll be so big, sometimes up to 200% this embryonic size at birth, and actually mom is not successfully getting through this. So. Pretty massive problem in one direction of the cross. It's hard to say if this direction of the cross is smaller with these data. So what we've done then is looked at growth curves over time. So this is the just looking at the cross that you know we would predict to be smaller if there's parent origin side effects. The other reciprocal cross is not in this growth curve because they never get past birth. And so what we see is the two species are different in size. Um, there's a significant difference in size that we see, and then the hybrids are significantly smaller than either parental. So in the reciprocal cross, we see the small size and, and or massive size in the other cross. So classic parent of origin effects. We see something else that's pretty that caught us by surprise. That's pretty cool. The undergrown cross is strongly male biased, and there's reduced numbers of females. And so um, these are up to, I think, 100 to 150 animals, but this number of litters. We see typical sex ratios in the two species. In the cross that is undergrown, we see the skewed sex ratio, small litter size, but it's due to a loss of females. So the number of males is pretty much consistent. Um, so this suggests that there may be differential inviability of females, which is interesting because um, this is one of the Haldane's rules suggests that when one sex is rare or sterile in a cross, it should be the male. But here we actually see a loss of females, so there's potentially an exception to Haldane's rule in this inviability phenotype. So it, it did catch us by surprise. What we're doing right now is we've, in last week, we actually got, the, we got sex markers that we can sex de, um, determine the, the uh, we got X-link markers where we can determine the the species origin of these hybrids. And we're, we're going back in development and asking if the reciprocal cross is also skewed in sex ratio, embryos that are being differentially aborted are, are skewed in sex ratio, and at what point does this happen? Is this the mother calling her litter, or is it actually fundamentally an inviability phenotype in utero? And so we're, we're tackling that right now, and hopefully we'll have that answer pretty soon. So we have this really interesting phenotype. We have this genetic mechanism that may be contributing to it. We've just begun to take the first steps to address the genetic basis of this by looking at imprinting in the, in the placenta. So our parent of origin growth effects caused by disrupted genomic imprinting. There are hundreds of genes that are imprinted in the placenta 
including dozens that influence growth or repress growth that are maternally or paternally expressed. So we've been sequencing cDNA, this is just a standard Sanger sequencing of cDNA, to ask if we're seeing <coughs> ma maintenance of imprinting or not. Okay? So this is a gene that is maternally expressed. It tends to repress growth. Um, we see this allele in Campylii, we see this allele in Sangoris, and then in the two hybrids, we're seeing actually maintenance of imprinting here. So there's no, if you get a loss of imprinting, you would expect heterozygosity at these sites. Paternally expressed gene is actually maintaining imprinting here. This is IGF2, it's a famous growth factor. And so we've looked at a handful of candidate genes and we actually see maintenance of imprinting for those candidate genes. Um, so we haven't directly linked this to imprinting yet. I think it's probably still the likely scenario, but I'm actually thrilled by this negative result. Because what I really didn't want to see not that you really want to see something in your results, but I didn't want to see something that was a lot like the X chromosome where, where everything is disrupted, right? If imprinting was globally lost, and we'd see every gene that was imprinted is no longer imprinted. This suggests, if imprinting is involved, that it's locus specific, which means that we can get much closer to the genetic basis of it. So what we're doing now is we're doing whole genome targeted transcriptomic sequencing of these placentas to actually identify the genes that are disrupted in imprinting and link that directly to this and actually ask if we're getting loss of key growth factors or repressors that cause the phenotype. So that's kind of what we're in, um, actively doing right now. So for that abnormal hybrid development in dwarf hamsters, we see these strong parent of origin growth effects. It's one of the few cases, probably the fourth or fifth case, where the, the strong parent of origin growth effects have been documented in a mammal, um, at least on the phenotypic level. We think it may be even much more common than that. We see the strongly male bias sex ratio, possible exception to hold inch rule. It's a pretty interesting finding. We see growth effects that are consistent with a loss of imprinting of alleles derived from Sangoris. So the patterns we see are consistent with alleles. Very, we would predict that alleles that are in, um, expressed either maternally or paternally from Sangoris, and that's being disrupted in the hybrids, and that's causing the overgrowth or undergrowth. We see at a handful of candidate genes, imprinting is maintained, and thus there's no global disruption. So we may be able to identify specific genes where disruption is the proximate cause of, of isolation. Okay, so two kind of very different processes, but linked inherently to developmental processes that be, could influence hybrid um, viability or fertility. So we, I showed you evidence that the Myox sex chromosome inactivation or a related process appears to be disrupted in house mice, and that we're testing whether or not genomic imprinting and embryonic pathways are disrupted in these hamsters. Hybrid male sterility in mammals and in animals in general is common. Dis um, abnormal growth is common in mammals. These are two key pro um, general patterns in the literature that we expect to see. And I think that these two processes may be inherently linked to the evolution of reproductive isolation, so it leads to a lot of interesting questions. Why are these very rapidly evolving, or are there other aspects of this that are driving the, the evolution of these key developmental pathways? Another really interesting thing about genomic imprinting is the other place where things tend to be imprinted is the brain, and it influences behavior. So in the placenta, it influences growth, but in the brain, you'll get either expression of maternal or paternal alleles, and it influences either maternal or paternal behaviors. This kind of disruption, if it exists, nobody's ever looked at that, but if, it if that kind of brain imprinting is disrupted, we could have a much more general suite of phenotypes that are actually linked to, to reduced fitness of hybrids, for example, abnormal behavior or disruptive behavior. So this, this general imprinting pathway is a pretty intriguing process to look at for generalities in the evolution of reproductive isolation. So with that, I'd just like to thank a handful of people um, in particular, Dan Vanderpool, Tom Brecky, and Colin Prather, and, and Sarah Phillips Keeble, who are in the lab actually actively doing this work, and uh, Michael Nachman for supporting some of the work, funding sources, um, all of you for your attention. Lots of work on all of this research, so if you want to work in a beautiful place, <laughs> right here, let me know. Lots to do, and thank you very much. Um, so people need to leave for whatever, they do so, but let's have some questions.
didn't mention um, horses and donkeys. I would think that kind of yep. across you have a lot of information known about it, and you could get at this size. So there. So that's one of the other. I didn't mention it because um, it maybe is a little bit more complicated. In, in my mind, I don't have it quite worked out, but it is one of the classic examples. There are a couple of horse crosses, equid crosses, that um, result in parent of origin effects. So we see it in horses, we see it in several rodents, and we see it in um, the lions and tigers and maybe some other felid crosses. The really cool thing that has been, every case where it's been anecdotally described, um, there's some indication that there's actually differences in the, the mating system and social system of the different species. So we see differences in paternal care in hamsters. There's differences in monogamy versus polygamy in deer mice. Um, social versus um, solitary in lions and tigers. Very interesting ideas that there could be evolutionary patterns that lead to these differential imprinting between these species, and that could be the source of evolutionary burdens. It would be great. So people have looked a little bit at disruption, of, I think, of disruption of imprinting in horses and found some indication of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Has this been detected in any natural populations, or is it only known from experimental crosses? Or that's a great question. Disrupt. I don't think disruption of imprinting has ever been looked at in natural populations. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, it's a great. It's a great next step. It's certainly. So it's been described in house mice at some level. Um, and, and so it would be a good place to look in a hybrid zone and just look for natural hybrids that, that show this pattern. But it really is just really under-examined. It's been tested, disruption of imprinting has been tested in basically two systems, a, ho a house mouse system and the deer mice. And they actually the patterns they see are slightly different, but the mechanism is very similar. But it's never been carried out to nature, and that would be great. I, mean, I really would like it if the hamsters overlap in geography. We, I'm going to have to get the southern Russia to answer that, so maybe next year. <laughs> so, but to come back to the mouse, do you see parent of this parent of origin effects on phenotypes of hybrids in the musculus domesticus? So crosses. It hasn't really been tested in the musculus domesticus cross for, you mean for the, um, for imprinting in particular. Well, no, just for the, for the phenotype. Well, we do in a sense that the reciprocal crosses are asymmetric, but we've shown that that links directly to the X, right? right but I was thinking in terms of growth phenotypes or. or it's an interesting question, actually. When I started thinking about this, we see um, hybrid males are a lot bigger than females. And it seems, I didn't think, I thought it was heterosis of some sort because that we're dealing with these inbred animals, but I actually think it's specific to the male. So we actually may see something like this. Where people have studied it, it's a cross between domesticus and must spreadus, which is an outgroup. And at that slightly higher divergence, you actually get the placental overgrowth and, and some similar patterns to what you see in deer mice. But, uh, you know, actually most patterns of imprinting are described from house mice that are crosses between subspecies, which could be a problem. Okay. Because you need genetic divergence between two lines to actually detect these patterns. So we've been thinking about doing all the different crosses you could do in house mice to look at imprinting in the brain and the placenta. So it, it's, a, it's a good question. Yeah. yeah. So has any of this been done in plants, the imprinting issue? My understanding. A lot of plants don't have sex chromosomes, so right. they don't have that complication. There's evidence for. Plant biology is terrible. <laughs> there's evidence for. Um, there, th so there in plants, it's different because you have the, the 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 um, endosperm shows patterns of imprinting, and that's where it's been described, and that's where you have the three in genotype. And, and there you see patterns of imprinting. Whether or not that relates to um, hybrid disruption, I don't think people have got there yet. But there is, there are analogous imprinting processes at some developmental pathways in, in plants. And, it, and it, it's consistent with um, antagonistic processes that could drive a conflict between males and females and, and the outcome of the offspring. But um, I think it's also pretty wide open. In my understanding, I'm just thinking about course, there's lots and lots of studies of hybridization of reptiles and amphibians as well. We often you don't have starkly differentiated sex chromosomes or mm -hmm. you have more sort of polygenic genetic stimulation right. or TSD. Right. Um, and my understanding is that there isn't sort of genome wide imprinting or extensive imprinting. In That's my understanding too, that hasn't been described. 
I, I will say that... Which is why I can get a path in Genesis and so on. Right, exactly. So, you know, imprinting only, it doesn't really make sense that it would even evolve. It's amazing that it has even evolved, if you think about it. That you get, you lose Mendelian expression of genes, um, and, it, and you do so in a male versus female fashion. And, you know, it, it's a pretty cool process, and you wouldn't evolutionarily expect it to evolve in, in all circumstances. There's particular <coughs> scenarios where that might evolve. Um, I will say that the evidence for imprinting in mammals is growing exponentially as the ability to detect these, these processes have been um, refined. So it was a couple hundred genes in the placenta, now it's up to thousands of genes, largely in the brain and in the placenta, but uh, other places too, early, early embryonic development, key developmental steps. There are actually individual genes that are maternally expressed in the placenta and repress growth and the maternally expressed in the brain and the same gene and, and, and the paternal expression, alleles expressed, and influences male mating behavior. Same gene. Totally different functions. Wow. So it's, just, it's a really complicated <laughs> thing. It's, it's interesting. Other questions? Yeah. Have you done any crosses with the F1s in either of them? Like with the hybrids crossing them back to the parentals or with other hybrids? What in the hamsters? Um, sure. <laughs> well, so the, um, in the house mice, we've done the, re the reciprocal introgression lines were all based oh, on the back crosses. Yeah. We've done a lot of that, um, and we see that the phenotypes get more severe as we as we move from a heterozygous genomic background to a more you know, we integress that X. It gets things get pretty severe. We haven't in the hamsters. We've shown we recently show, showed you know that we could back cross them. So the females are fertile, and we can back cross them. Um, but we haven't done any mapping yet. That that's actually a something we'd like to do. Okay, uh, well, one more, and then we'll go back. And just a quick comment. It seems like maybe if, if you did some comparisons across mammals that were sexually dimorphic in size versus those that aren't, there might be some pattern there because mm -hmm. for the female, it would be pretty important to have an embryo in the first thing. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's an interesting idea. So the sexual dimorphism relating directly to embryonic size so you can yeah. successfully birth them. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting idea. In general, there's the there are interesting predictions about where you may see imprinting strongly or not, and people haven't really looked at the evolution of imprinting across mammals. We know that a lot of imprinted loci are shared between humans and mice, and that's about the extent of it, but a lot of them aren't. And how that maps onto diversity and sexual dimorphism, mating system, polygamy, monogamy, um, social structure, all these things that could influence antagonistic evolution is not clear. So it's, a, it's totally wide open. Okay, let's wrap it up. Jeff's around for the remainder of today and tomorrow, so let me know if you want to get some time.